different. Yeah. The Bar Podcast. Uh, Biblical uh, reform, let's uh, go. Uh, yeah. Uh, Welcome to the bar. Come on and pull up a seat. And open up your Bible. What a wonderful feat. The living bread. And we're discussing what it means for the streets. The inner cities and the burbs and every person we meet. That's where we challenge worldviews that we hear from world news. In light of the scripture, yeah, we are here to serve you. We're your source for resources. Come to help you on your way as you battle mean forces. Yo, this is for the people who can see the importance of sound theology and the scripture that support it. Yeah, this is for the truth lovers, biblically reforming and preaching. Christ of the nations, yeah. the nations. Welcome to the modern reformation. Yeah. Welcome everybody to the bar. It's your guest host, David Knight from Exposit the Word, standing in for Dwayne. Different host, same show, and same top top guests so let's get to it because i am super excited to be coming through your speakers your earbuds wherever you are listening to the bar and as always we are grateful that you are listening and we love to start off the show by thanking you the listeners for tuning in and supporting the show and just like we do every tuesday we bring you another awesome guest and this one is no different Hello and welcome, Holly Pivock and Doug Guyvet. How are you both doing? Doing great. Hi, David. Good to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good. Doing well. Glad to be with you again already. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you both. You, we, we had a great conversation a year ago. There might be some people that didn't actually hear or watch that first interview. So just tell us everything we need to know about you both in 60 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm a pastor's wife. I'm a mom. And I'm a researcher of um, cults and aberrant groups, such as the New Apostolic Reformation Movement, uh, which I've written uh, four books now uh, with Doug about this movement. Um, uh, Prior to writing the books, I was working at Biola University in Southern California as the uh, university editor there, the managing editor of, of their Biola magazine. How about you, Doug? Well, I uh, am now Emeritus Professor of Philosophy after 30-plus years of teaching in Christian higher education, uh, most of that at Biola University and the Talbot School of Theology. Uh, I teach courses in uh, Christian apologetics and then in various branches of philosophy, including the history of modern philosophy and a branch called epistemology, some philosophy of religion and so forth. So those are the areas in which I've done most of my teaching and writing and uh, travel and speaking. Uh, I have a family with two grown daughters, and my wife and I have been married uh, 40 years. So how's that for 60 seconds worth? I think you put wonderful. You filled it. You filled it beautifully, both of you. Well done. <laughs> so you both um, just co-authored a, another book together. This is how many times have you written together? Is this the second time? Well, we have we have four books we've written together. All together. Right. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, this is the fourth thing. Yeah. And this one's titled Reckless Christianity, which focuses on the destructive teachings and practices of Bill Johnson and Bethel Church in Redding, California. Tell us why you felt the need to raise the alarm and write this book. Well, this, so this book, our fourth book, focuses specifically on Bethel Church in Redding, California, and which is, uh, for your audience, if they don't know, that's the most influential church today in the world. Um, that's part of this new apostolic reformation movement that we've written all of our books about. And so the influence of Bethel is is huge. It's global. We hear from people from all around the world. We receive letters from people talking about um, the way the the teachings and the practices from Bethel Church have have come into their own churches. And the um, wake of destruction and division and damage that's been left behind from those teachings. And um, we felt a need to really take a deep dive into the teachings of Bethel Church um, because it is so influential and um, because of its global reach. And so our previous book, Counterfeit Kingdom, our, our, our last book, it did talk about the teachings of Bethel, but it didn't go as deep. And so we wanted to have a book that that so for people that, um, you know, said, well, you said they said this, but they would respond this way. How would you respond to that? So it can go layers 
deeper into the argumentation. It's very heavily documented using their own works and writings to show, you know, that what we're saying they teach, they actually do teach. So this book shows just how fringe and how extreme the teachings of this church are, how radical they are. It shows that it's definitely a part of the new apostolic reformation movement uh, beyond any shadow of doubt, despite what the leaders of the church might claim, uh, you Mm -hmm. know, as they attempt to distance themselves from this controversial movement. And it also shows that the more mainstream Christian leaders who have attempted to defend Bethel um, really um, have no excuse for doing so because the teachings are so extreme. You guys have spent a lot of your life now um, looking at the New Apostolic Reformation and and obviously, like you're saying, Bethel, this is what this book's all about. You don't. You mentioned how huge this is. You don't have to go very far before you, you know, you, you come into contact with somebody that will tell you that they love Bethel. How do you guys react to that? Are you have you just got, you know, do, do you do you interrupt that conversation very quickly and, and sound the alarm, or have you have you found a way of just, you, you know, how do you both individually deal with that? Well, I would say that uh, that's a case by case. That depends on the circumstances, what I know of the person, how well I know them. If they're friends, then of course we can we can get into it more quickly. If uh, if they're strangers, maybe so too. Um, I might just say, you know, that's interesting to me. I know a bit about Bethel myself. We've I have a co-author. I've written uh, several books with uh, discussing Bethel's theology and practices. And uh, I wonder if you'd be interested in talking about your experience. That would be one way to go. And a person who hasn't written on it, but has read a book that they found helpful, be it one of ours or something else, they could do the same. They could say, I'm very interested in that. Uh, In fact, I've read uh, a couple of things about it, and uh, I've got some questions. I don't think I've ever had an opportunity to talk to somebody before uh, who's actually part of Bethel Church. If that's your experience, that's a natural entry point, and they do want to talk about their church. It's a 24-7 culture that's cultivated, and and, uh, it's front and center in their minds all the time. So they do want to talk about it. Now, when, when you begin to ask critical questions, Questions, uh, the kind of response you get can vary, and that can vary depending on whether you're talking to a leader or uh, a neophyte, somebody who's a, 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 maybe a new uh, insider inside the, the movement. So you have to w- take it step by step and see what kind of openness is really there. Yeah, that's really helpful. What about you, Holly? Yeah, I I think um, Doug, Doug said it well. You know, I would ask someone if someone's – kind of just heard of Bethel, but they're, they don't know a lot about it. You know, I would ask if they're aware of some of the extreme things that have, that are taught or practiced, Bethel. you know, the attempts, like their attempts to raise that two year, you know, two year old little girl from the dead back in 2019 yeah. and those type of things and just see what they know as far as how extreme the teachings are. Yeah, it's really helpful. Really good. Thank you. You start your new book by giving some helpful insights into the person behind Bethel, which is Bill Bill Johnson. Uh, What's his story? Well, uh, you know, we start, yeah, we start off the book actually talking about an experience he had in 1995 that he recounts in his book, When Heaven Invades Earth. And he talks about this experience he had where he was uh, laying in bed, I believe, and he felt like um, he just had like a thousand volts of electricity going through his body, jolting through his body. And, you know, um, he just, um, had this encounter that he thought with God. Um, and, um, he, he began crying out for more of God, God, I want more of you. I want more of you. And this was something that was an ongoing thing that he was crying out to God. And, um, he felt like that he, God made a deal with him that basically God would give him more of him and answer his his request for more of him if he would be if Bill Johnson would be willing to give up his dignity um, in, in response and Bill Johnson agreed so or so he you know he tells the story he made this deal with God and so shortly after that um, sometime after that Bethel he would Bill Johnson at the time was pastoring an Assemblies of God Church in Weaverville California a little town in Northern California and then he was invited to take the pastorship at um, Bethel Church in Reading, where the church we wrote this book about. And um, he agreed, but he said he had one non-negotiable condition and that and that 
his focus would always be the pursuit of revival, which we explain in his view is inseparable from the pursuit of miracles. And so he determined to make Bethel Church like this spiritual laboratory, this laboratory for spiritual experimentation. And so that the, he said that, you know, he wanted the church to become a place where they could experiment and try to figure out what would generate miraculous power, what type of practices they can engage in that would allow people to learn to work miracles, heal the sick, prophesy, raise the dead even. And and so so he's made intentionally made Bethel a place to experiment and figure out how they can learn to develop miraculous powers, because that's a core teaching in the New Apostolic Reformation is that the church, the global church needs to ride up as this end time miracle working army in order to have the supernatural power that's needed to bring God's kingdom to earth. And so because of that, they've pursued many um, uh, teachings and practices that that many people outside of Bethel would look at as extreme and very unbiblical and even dangerous. Um, but that's been something they've in, they said they've intentionally pursued this this um, kind of uh, reckless. That's to use their term, this reckless kind of yeah. experimental approach to Christianity. Um, that's been that's been something they've intentionally pursued. And we have to stress this point that when he demanded to have more of God, in effect, he was talking about empowerment in the miraculous. Uh, he wasn't talking about having uh, a, a deeper knowledge of Scripture or having, um, you know, uh, a clear path of uh, just church growth or what have you uh, in general terms. He wanted God to endow him with greater miraculous power and to lead a ministry that would be a ministry specializing in the miraculous. So I think it, it helps to understand that because people might desire more of God in the sense that we see expressed in the scriptures, for example, throughout the Psalms. And yet uh, there we don't see it uh, expressed that way. There are people who uh, are examples in the New Testament, for example, I should say, who uh witnessed the power of God, miraculous power of God, and wanted in on it, uh, but uh, their demands were were not really in accord with God's uh, reasons for performing the miraculous. So I mention that because uh, it is appropriate to desire to have a deeper relationship with God, a deeper knowledge of God and a deeper knowledge of his word, but to say, I want more of you. And then to say that this is to issue in a more miraculous ministry, I think helps people understand better a little bit more about the person. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the size of Bethel. Today, more than 11,000 people call Bethel Church their home with millions of people tuning in to watch their videos and read their books and download their music. Just how have they become so well known around the world? Well, today, you know, they're especially known because of their music. Bethel Music, their music label is some of the most popular music used by churches uh, throughout the world. Um, even churches that are not part of the New Apostolic Reformation movement use their music. And and so many people have told us that's how they first um, got drawn into this movement is by listening to the music and they loved it so much. Then they researched the church that produced it or, you know, found out who produced it and then got drawn in. Um, but beyond that, you know, e even before then, um, uh, before Bethel Music was as popular as it is today, they became really well known because of Glory Cloud glory clouds that they were saying that were appearing at their church. Um, it was something like, you know, over 20 times, 26 times, I think it was that they said this, this kind of glittery cloud like substance appeared during worship meetings at their church. And some people would take pictures with their phones or, you know, with cameras and then put it up on YouTube. And so that really attracted, um, it drew attention to the church initially. And then there were other reports of things happening at the church, um, reports that miraculous healings were occurring or, or reports that um, angel feathers were appearing during meetings, you know, fluttering down from the ceiling or that there were indoor gusts of wind that were explainable that would just occur all, all of the sudden in the middle of a meeting, um, these type of things. And so... And then, of course, uh, Bethel 
does a lot of marketing as well. They'll take um, testimonies of healing that have allegedly occurred at their church and things like that. And they'll produce these very yeah. slick um, videos, you know, and marketing materials that they, they put out um, through social media. And so they have a huge social media presence with hundreds of thousands of followers. Um, and so that also has um, attracted a lot of people to the church. Yeah. There's nobody more qualified to, to, to know this. I know you've had interactions with so many people who, who have been drawn into Bethel through music. There, there are pastors here and church leaders here in the UK who actually say, you know, it's only songs. We're only singing music. The, the music's fine. We've we've looked at the words. Theologically, they're sound. But there is a direct line, isn't there? You, you know, you've spoken to people before. They've they've been hooked in by listening to the music and then have got sucked into the theology of Bethel. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, that is right. The music is, uh, according to our research, the number one entree or entry point into the movement uh, and and directly into uh, Bethel Church because Bethel has its own music label and it's a multi-million dollar production uh, garnering for them uh, not only uh, considerable physical benefits – but a reputation worldwide for producing music that helps people feel closer to God and closer to each other in in spiritual communion. Uh, now, in our earlier book of a year and a half ago, Counterfeit Kingdom, we have a chapter in which we describe uh, some of the claims they make about the role that music is meant to play. Uh, this is not accidental, and they've been candid about it. Uh, for example, Bill Johnson himself, the apostle at the church in Reading, uh, has said that music is a means of sort of circumventing our critical faculties and uh, getting people to believe something that they wouldn't believe if they were just taught that. Now, that presumably means that even if you open the Bible and explain to them this is what the Bible says, uh, that would be less convincing than singing the songs. And I think he's right about that, unfortunately. And so they are intent on exploiting that. And as we say in that book, we think that for many churches today, for many Christians today, whether they're NAR or not even – uh, music is functioning like the catechism of the church. It's a means of inculcating in the minds of people and embedding deeply into their souls the rhythm of a certain theology. And it's something that sticks. It stays with them from place to place. And music is a, a mighty culture-building uh, tool that can be used for good, but it can also be dangerous and it means that we need to be much more vigilant and alert. And so we offer guidelines in that chapter about uh, what to look for. Now, you would think that it would be a simple matter, that you would just simply study the lyrics. And in those cases, those few songs if or few or, or many songs that had um, – lyrics that conflicted with scripture, you would simply not sing those songs. But it's more complicated than that because the actual meaning of the lyrics depends upon the intentions of the producers. That's what we call authorial intent when it comes to studying scripture. And so uh, we need to ask, well, what's the intention of the authors of these lyrics? And knowing what the leaders are saying about it helps, but then also knowing the theology of the movement helps because they load familiar terminology with new meaning. And it isn't just that you could be singing songs that mean something different to the, to the composers, but – from the composer's point of view, you may actually be performing an act through your utterance of those words that they believe has divine power to realize manifestations of the Spirit in your life and in your church. In other words, um, one illustration is you know how much Christian music is sort of an expression of prayer. And uh, that would typically be petitionary prayer or prayers of thanksgiving and adoration of God and his purposes for us in the world. But in the NAR movement, there is a premium placed on a different kind of prayer. It's not biblical prayer that they call declaration prayer. And their music is written with declarations in mind so that when you sing it, 
you it is tantamount to singing declaration prayers that are meant to leverage the power of God to make things happen in your world without asking with humility that God would do certain things for you. Mm -hmm. So you want to understand the theology that informs the lyrics so that you can evaluate the song in its tone. And decide then whether you want to be a participant in that kind of activity. I was going to ask you this later, but this is a great time to to mention it because you've just mentioned, you know, what what we would recognise as sort of like the name it and claim it. These declaration prayers, where you know they they turn God almost into a genie like figure. Um, and again, all, all of these things that we see happening in Bethel Red in California, even if some churches don't know the origin of them, they seep they seep into the local church, don't they? Now. What what do these prayers sound like? If somebody was, you know, going to be in a prayer meeting and, and this might somebody might be parroting the way that they pray, what what may that sound like? You know, you can find um, lots of prayer examples of prayer declarations. Um, I mean, you could go online right now and Google prayer declarations, and just pages and pages come up of declarations people can make for prosperity. You know, um, you know, I declare that. Um, you know, that I will be prosperous or, or that, you know, um, healing, a lot of declarations for physical healing. I declare, you know, that my body will be healthy and, um, or that I'll succeed wherever I go. You know, a lot of times they'll take, um, words from scripture and, and work them into their declarations. Um, but, um, and, and actually people could go to Bethel church's website, and read what they call their offering readings. And there's actually, they actually have offering readings, which are really declarations that they make before they pass the offering plates at Bethel Church. Everybody stands up and recites a list of declarations about, um, you know, that that we have, an, we, we list them in our book, actually, in Reckless Christianity, but, you know, that they believe that this week that they'll receive, like, checks in the mail or um, you know, they'll find money or things like that, you know, and, and, and so they believe that by saying that in faith before they give their money to the church, to Bethel church, that, that makes God more likely to fulfill those, uh, declarations for them. And so that, that motivates their giving to the church. And that's also related to the prosperity gospel yeah. teachings that you referenced. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes further in that they think that, by reciting these collectively, where the more the merrier, uh, there's greater efficacy in the words. That is to say, they have greater power and they are more effectual. They bring about what they intend when they speak that way. So having uh, social media is a very valuable tool for them because they can have people chiming in with the same prayer declarations globally uh, right there from Redding, California, and believe that uh, their words have greater effect and greater power as a result. And if uh, if you have a lack of faith or if you can't get people involved uh, with you in it, then that could jinx your prayers. Uh, and so there is a kind of uh, superstitious aspect to this that's layered in there. But, of course, it's never thought of that way. And our biggest concern is not only that it uh, resembles uh, incantations of a sort, but it is not endorsed by anything in the scriptures. Uh, you'd have to, and it's also you could call it prophetic prayer because you'd have to have a knowledge of what the future holds with such divine authority that you could declare it to be so before it happens. And uh, and there's no basis for that. Uh, so people that are that don't even conceive of themselves as prophets participate in this declaration prayer, whether by uh, a kind of chant or just writing it on on uh, their their uh, social media outlets or singing in their churches. They would be participating, though they wouldn't be prophets themselves. They would be functioning in a kind of prophetic capacity. Uh, by participating in that way. Yeah. We see this in the area of money, like you already mentioned, but another another big area is in health, isn't it? And one of the most controversial things that Bethel teach is that it's always God's will to heal. But our, loved experience tell, uh, our lived experience tells us that this can't be the case as we all die at some point, don't we? <laughs> tell us about this. 
Yeah, and it's yeah. Uh, that's a sure thing for each of us. We know that about ourselves, but we know about it for them too. I mean, the, <laughs> uh, the same things that plague our lives living in a fallen world are also nagging them as well. Yeah. And so uh, it's there's a disconnect between expectation and reality here, and there's going to be that uh, right up until the return of Jesus Christ for his church. Yeah. Yeah, we talk we talk in our, you know, reckless Christianity about, you know, I'm um, sadly Bill Johnson's own wife, Benny, passed away um from cancer. His father passed away. Um, you know, his son, one of his sons has struggles with deafness. You know, he wears glasses. Bill Johnson wears glasses. And so, you know, we say all these things just to point out that the lived experience of the people in this movement doesn't match line up with their teachings and what their own what the expectation should be about the type of you know health they would experience in their own families and in their own settings based on on what their teachings are. Um, so it doesn't line up what line up with reality. You know, young people who make the trek to Bethel in Reading are not going to discover the fountain of youth in the parking lot there. Uh, And so (laughs) uh, the realities of uh, sin in the world are going to catch up with us and our physical bodies eventually. Uh, And our hope is not in the uh, constant uh, healing from every disease and sickness that comes along. It's in our future resurrection and uh, eternal life with Jesus Christ, which, uh, of course, means that we have the Holy Spirit in the present, and it does give us the ability to endure uh, the difficulties of life. And those actually serve an important purpose in our lives. So there are lots of problems, theological problems with this teaching that God wants you well and that it is his intention uh, to spare you any of these physical maladies. And uh, that's all, we're only scratching the surface in the few comments that we've made about the problems with that. And of course, you know, that's not to say that God doesn't heal today. You know, right. um, God, we believe God can and, and does do miracles today still. Um, but, and then we, we're very clear about this in all of our interviews and all the books we've written too, that we're not, um, critiquing classical Pentecostal or, or charismatic teachings, uh, about the miraculous gifts, such as prophesying, speaking in tongues, healing the teachings of the new apostolic reformation go far beyond those teachings. when they say that apostles and prophets are supposed to hold these authoritative offices governing the church and all others, including pastors are supposed to submit to them. And receive the new revelations they claim that they're giving that are critical for the church. Um, And so, um, you know, these revelations are critical, they would say, for the church to bring God's physical kingdom to earth to eradicate. um, You know, they say bringing heaven to earth is what Bethel Church says. So eradicate poverty, all poverty, all sickness, all disease, and literally bring what they would say, bring heaven to earth. Um, And so these teachings go far beyond what Pentecostals or Charismatics have taught. And are have, are actually have caused many Pentecostals and Charismatics to be very concerned and alarmed by um, how extreme these teachings are. Yeah, and because yeah. of that, we need to note that uh, some who claim to speak on behalf of the movement of classical Pentecostalism or Charismatic teaching, who defend NAR without giving uh, obvious evidence of being NAR themselves, are not speaking for the mainstream. So many people have left NAR churches uh, to uh, testify that the things that we're describing are true, and they have the devastating effects that we've been talking about there, and yet – there are defenders who say this is the, – the NAR is not a, a real thing, and it's not dangerous. And these are coming th- – these these claims are sometimes made by people who've built a reputation for being major spokesmen for classical Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement. Mm-hmm. And so it needs to be noted that if they're prepared to make those claims and defend NAR in those terms – they are not good representatives of 
the Pentecostal charismatic stream of the church, the mainstream of the church there. Uh, I don't mean that charismatics and Pentecostals are the mainstream of the church. I mean that they they think that they're speaking for the mainstream of that tradition. And uh, I mean, one good example of this would be Michael Brown or Dr. Michael L. Brown, who has a podcast. He's an evangelist. And uh, for many, many years, he's uh, developed a narrative about himself as a major spokesman for the Pentecostal charismatic movement. But he is vigorously defending NAR and saying it's not dangerous. Yeah. And so it needs to be noted that he cannot have it both ways uh, yeah. because this is such a departure from the mainstream of the tradition that he says he represents. Yeah, yeah. It's very helpful. Thank you. In practice, these guys do not believe in a close canon of scripture as they continue to seek and, and give fresh new revelation. Why is this really concerning? So the leaders in this movement will say that scripture, that the canon, you know, they 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 believe essentially in a close canon of scripture. And that they would say that we're to test all things by scripture, by the written word of God, and that that's their final and highest authority. But that being said, they also teach that there are prophets today that are giving new revelations um, for the global church. Uh, they're doc doctrinal in nature. And um, so they they would say that all Christians must accept these new revelations so that they'll have strategies um, to develop miraculous powers, to rise up as this miracle working army, and to um, wage spiritual warfare, to cast out high-ranking demons, they would say, rule over the societal institutions. And so all of these are given through revelations of prophets in the movement. And, and those people who don't accept the revelations um, will sit on the sidelines as mere spectators, while those who do will actually fulfill God's plans and purposes for the end times. And so, so when they say that they um, accept scripture as their highest authority and they test all things by scripture, that's actually undermined and, mm -hmm. and even contradicted by um, these other teachings about the type of revelation that and the critical type of revelation that they claim their prophets are giving. They might say that the. Uh, revelations they receive are not equivalent to scripture. They wouldn't be canonical if somebody regarded them as authoritative in that way. But there are problems with that claim as well. Any word from God is going to be uh, equally authoritative alongside any other word from God. So, for example, in the Hebrew Bible, we know of uh, the writing prophets that included Isaiah and Jeremiah, major prophets, and then minor prophets who also wrote uh, smaller books of prophecy in the canon. Uh, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, there are several, right? Uh, but even apart from them, there were speaking prophets who didn't leave behind writings like Elijah and Elisha. And uh, all in every case, their word was a, no less authoritative for being non-written uh, mm -hmm. or non-canonical. So uh, what is the point of claiming that you've received a word from God if you're then going to say, but it doesn't have the same degree of authority that uh, written words of God have? And they don't want to word it that way because that would then undermine themselves in a more obvious way. But they do undermine themselves by saying that it wouldn't be uh, tantamount in uh, to, to Scripture. What's the point of saying that? It still has the same authority, the same backing from God that any revelation would if it really is from God. So that, that's an important singular point. Another is that their teachings are theological. Uh, they may be uh, regarding various practices and strategies for uh, achieving their goals in the world, but th their doctrine of uh, declaration prayer, for example, that's extra biblical. That is to say it's something you get apart from Scripture. Well, if uh, that's practical theology, it says things about what God uh, is like and what kinds of prayers he responds to and how our words can have power in the world. That's an ontological claim, and uh, that's theological. So that won't do. It won't do to say, well, our revelations are not theologically significant. And also, a third point is that uh, for many, 
it's these revelations that are attracting people. It's not how they preach the Bible and how clear the Bible becomes for them when they sit under their teaching. You know, some people say that about their churches. They say that what drew me to this church, some other church, is uh, that I'm so much better better able to understand scripture as I listen to a minister of the word who has spent his life uh, studying the scriptures and then trying to explain it clearly for people like myself. And that's not what draws people. What draws them is the extra biblical revelation, the non-biblical revelations. So they have a kind of priority for those people, these new revelations that uh, are the 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 clear draw for them and and so if it wasn't for those revelations Bethel Church would not be the attraction uh, that it is. If it wasn't for their mythology about the miraculous, both in terms of the theology that they teach about how it works and also in terms of the uh, claims and the narrative that they're happening every day round the clock, uh, if it wasn't for that narrative – they wouldn't be attracting the people that they do. And so uh, they can't do without that and survive. And so it supplants the effectiveness of the word of God itself, which has canonical authority. So, so on the one hand, they'll say that their revelations aren't like the canon, which su- suggests that they believe that the canon has a greater authority for our lives. But then in practice, it turns out that that's not what matters most. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about the training center for miracle workers known as the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. So Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry is a three-year full-time program at Bethel Church in Reading, um, where college-age students, generally college-age students, will enroll to essentially to learn to become miracle workers. And now their te- their school people can also enroll in their school online and there's our schools of supernatural ministry patterned after the one at Bethel and often utilizing the curriculum at Bethel at churches throughout the world now so these schools of supernatural ministry are popping up in churches and you know in these you know students in Bethel school of supernatural ministry have fondly referred to their their own school as a Christian Hogwarts like the Hogwarts yeah. You know, the school of of witchcraft and wizardry and the Harry Potter books and films Um, and the type of practices that they engage in, um, the type of ways they seek to activate. That's a a NAR buzzword, activate miraculous powers within themselves, like learning to prophesy and and heal the sick. Um, They they look more like new age and occultic practices um, than anything, any biblical practices. and so they have, for example, what you call prophetic activation exercises, where in order to teach uh, students to prophesy, they'll um, have them play something like prophetic uno. They call it prophetic uno, like the uno card game, except they put a twist on it. And they say, you know, they have a group of uh, several students get together and they'll and they'll draw a card. And if they draw a certain color card, they'll say you should prophesy to the person on one side about, you know, um, their their financial destiny and if you draw another color card you're supposed to prophesy to another person in the group maybe on your other side about um their career or their destiny or something like that and so they're there or they'll blindfold people and have them stand uh, two people maybe and have them stand like back to back and or and one person is supposed to just prophesy say whatever comes into their head is a message from god for the the other person and they don't even know who that person is and they just whatever pops into their head and so they're teaching, they're activating them, they would say, in a prophetic gift in order to give messages and revelation from God. Um, and they'll admit that their teachings and practices do look a lot like New Age teachings. And, and they'll say, shockingly, what they say is that the reason is New Agers actually stole these practices from Christians, that these type of practices were used, you know, were practiced by the first yeah. century church. They, they were lost through the centuries, and now they're redeeming them and reclaiming them as as like essential practices for the the global church to rise up as this miracle working army. 
one of the frustrations, and I'm sure you uh, share this as well, is when Bethel do get caught out doing something really weird, they they often backtrack and and claim that they never actually did that, or it's you know it was a joke, um, and it ends up becoming a spiritual game of whack a mole, doesn't it? Where you know one mm. one weird thing seems to drop off a conveyor belt, and then another one comes along after grave soaking or grave sucking is, is was a well known uh, you know example of this. Um, this is obviously, you know, brand management, isn't it? They're managing their their brand here. But what's your experience of this, guys? What, what, what have you seen them do here? Uh, the first example that comes to my mind because it's so dramatic and so serious is the case of uh, Olive Heilingenthal, who was the two-year-old child who passed away. Uh, she was the daughter of members of the Bethel Church in Redding, California. This is a few years ago. And uh, her mother is on the worship team at the church. And when she passed away, they decided that uh, they would um, practice declaration prayer. And of course they would. Uh, So they began to uh, declare that Olive would rise. The church leadership participated in this and so authorized it and participated. Uh, and and basically became a global phenomenon through social media again, where people were saying, um, you know, wake up Olive, and uh, wake up Olive was like a command for Olive to wake up from the dead, and that was the expectation. They truly believed it, and this conforms to the practice and the teaching about declaration prayer that we were talking about earlier. They make a very clear distinction between declaration prayer and uh, other sorts of prayer. Praying petitions is different than declaration prayer. And they think that petitionary prayer is inferior because it shows a lack of faith and it gives you a way out if things don't turn out the way that you uh, pray. So it's a cop-out to pray petitionary prayers. Biblical prayer is a cop-out on this view. Now, uh, after declarations, after declarations, after declarations over a period of days, nothing happened and Olive did not wake up. She was not raised from the dead. So they then had to express, uh, you know, explain themselves to the rest of the world. And when they did, they resorted to petitionary prayer. And they began to describe what they were doing as if it was petitionary prayer, which it was not. And so God had his own reasons for not um, answering our requests in the way that we desired. Well, so now we've got the initial offense of advising prayer for the resurrection of Olive in this declaration form, which is not authorized by Scripture. That's the first offense. Instead of teaching people a a better theology of, of death and of our hope and our future resurrection and training people in the best way to manage difficult circumstances in life, they participated in this false form of prayer and raised expectations. That by itself is a form of, I think it's ministerial malpractice of a of an extreme sort. And then, uh, having failed in their efforts, they the the hopes of people have been dashed, and there is an intensification of disillusionment for many who are alert to these things. And yet then they turn around and give what I think is a deceptive explanation for what happened by reverting to a different account of the activity that they were engaged in and reverting to a description of it as petitionary prayer, which they know is not the same thing as declaration prayer. So I think that's a brilliant example, but a tragic one on many levels of how uh, when things don't go as predicted – As prophesied, which is to say, as God told us they would, then we have to backtrack and and, um, go through various gymnastics to explain it away. And the amazing thing about this is that many people still believe, despite what would seem to be a transparent failure on a a, a dramatic scale – and a pastorally painful scale, and um, 
in contrast to what they were teaching so that there's actually confusion about what they uh, you know how how much deception might be involved when they go back and redescribe what happened. And regarding and regarding grave soaking, um, David, that you mentioned, you know, another example of um, uh, a cover up um, is, you know, you, you had these students, these BSSM students that were going to the grave sites of, of well-known miracle workers, um, such as the British faith healer Smith Wigglesworth or the American healing evangelist Catherine Coleman. And they were going there to soak up or, or suck up or they would say grab. The, the miraculous powers that that they believed were still resided like in the, the bones of these deceased miracle workers. And so you can find pictures online if you just Google it of of students, you know, leaning against graves or lying in front of them um, where they were trying to soak up these powers from the graves. And um, when this came to light, the BSSM students were doing this. Um, you know, Bethel leaders denied that they ever encouraged, that they ever taught or promoted this practice. Um, but the thing is, you can also go online and see a video of a Bethel pastor, a, a former Bethel pastor and, and a graduate of BSSM um, leading students in this practice. Um, you can see uh, Benny Johnson herself, the, the wife of the late wife of Bill Johnson, uh, which sure looks like she's taking part in this practice. And even the explanation that she gave online after the fact, you know, when, when she was talking about the incident, um, she, she uh, you know, seemed to admit that she was taking part in that practice, even though she said she wouldn't call it grave soaking or grave sucking. Um, but, um, you know, you have leaders denying that it was ever taught or promoted, but that seems to conflict with, the evidence that can be found online, the photos, the videos, and also testimonies of former BSSM students who actually went to the school and graduated and said they heard teachers there promoting this practice. And we document all of these things in Reckless Christianity so people can can find the sources for all of that. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. If a teaching coming from Bethel's very own teachers were not dangerous enough, they go on to show an absolute lack of discernment by partnering with all of this generation's most well-known false teachers, including Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn and Todd Bentley. But tell us about that. Well, that's right. There's not much discretion or discernment there either. But really, uh, I would place them in the same category as those individuals. I think that they uh, – <laughs> it isn't just that they endorse them, but they are uh, one of a kind. And uh, their endorsement just goes to show that that is the case. And if you invite uh, Bill Johnson to come and speak uh, in your church or to hold healing meetings and a revival seminar at your church, uh, how is that any different than inviting Kenneth Copeland to come uh, when uh, he clearly believes – in the power of Copeland's ministry, or he wouldn't have him in his own pulpit. So I think that that's these are all very telling signs, and uh, they people need to be alert to it. Uh, I mean, I I honestly believe that their their cover is blown on a regular basis because the claims they make just, so, just simply don't match up with reality, and they make promises but don't deliver on those promises. Uh, they've been in business now for decades. And yet, what is their track record? They have a track record of creating a narrative and producing music that people enjoy. But where are all the well-documented miracles that uh, they report uh, and that are used to draw attention to you know their location? Uh, it's, an, it's a fascinating study in how to obfuscate so that you can stay in business. And uh, that, of course, is pretty concerning to us because at this point in time now, there is a generation of young adults coming out of the church and out of the movement uh, who grew up with it, and it's all they know. And some of them are happy to participate, and there will always be a remnant or a group of people who will carry on, carry the torch for the next generation. But there are also young people and young men and women and, and adults now who grew up with this and they have they have questions and they are uh, seeing a discrepancy 
between the reality and the message. And what are they to do? Uh, they, <laughs> where are they to go to find the authentic um, gospel, liberating gospel message of Jesus Christ, given what they've grown up with? And I have a great concern about that. And my message to them is to understand that they're not alone in having doubts about their own movement and their own church tradition. And um, if they uh, will read their Bibles and begin to study and compare the scriptures with what they're hearing. Now, they need to read a, a, a reliable translation of scripture. And so I think they need to pick something other than the Passion translation. But uh, all, any of the, the main uh, reputable translations of the Bible into English would do. That would be a great wake up call. And to just have yourself reading one or two chapters a day through the Gospels, through the book of Acts. And then pick your way through the whole Bible and just let the Spirit of God use the Word of God in your soul to awaken you to the truth of these things. And, of course, any help you can get from other people who've uh, got personal testimonies after leaving the movement could be a great advantage to you. And reading books like the ones that we've written, which have not been uh, answered, I mean, are I'll give you an example. I would imagine if I was if I was listening to a talk like this or an interview like this one or reading a book like one that we've written, I'd be wondering, well, how accurate is their research and how reliable are their um, accounts of things that go on in, in NAR? And uh, one thing I can tell you is that on a regular basis, we hear from people who have participated in our churches and organizations from at every level, including the highest levels, who have left the movement and have told us that it's spot on. Now, we know our research has been meticulous. We know the effort that we've made to, to read and study and listen to the videos and so forth and visit the churches themselves and interview leaders when we can. So we've tried to do fullest dil diligence, due diligence, to be accurate in our uh exposition of the movement, but also to be students of the word and of clear thinking to evaluate the movement. But it adds a layer of credibility when you hear people who will tell you, this is exactly what I experienced. This is exactly what is being taught. And uh, you're, you're, you, we were talking with a gentleman a week ago. We were in a Zoom meeting with him, and uh, he had been a leader in the movement for decades, he uh, was on the ground involved with uh, Bill Johnson uh, early in the early days, with uh, Mike Bickle in the early days of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. And he said, you know, eventually I realized that this was not sound. And then uh, when I came across your books, I thought, yeah, these people have done their homework. They understand this. They're, they're exactly right. I said, is there anything you would disagree with in our books? And he said, no, I can't think of a single thing. <laughs> and then he went on to say that his own departure from the movement required a process of detoxification for himself. And this is the kind of thing we hear reported on a regular basis. So um, – I, th I think for, for those who are listening to this, that should at least give you, regardless of your experience, even if you love the music or you've been to Bethel and you, it's hard for you to believe these things, I would urge you to do a little reading from the other side. You know, it never hurts to go to your teachers, the people that you trust. It could be the Bill Johnsons or the Mike Bickles of the world, or it could be other people that have scholarship and a knowledge of Scripture from a different point of view. It never hurts to go to them and say, who are the people who disagree with you, the ones who are the most credible, who've written and spoken on this from a different point of view? Maybe they interpret Scripture differently. I'd like to be able to compare them for myself. Can you tell me who I should be reading from that point of view? You know, I have uh, a history of decades of teaching uh, university students, and I've lectured at universities worldwide uh, in, throughout Europe and South America, South Africa, uh, throughout the United States. And everywhere I go, you know, I encourage students to ask that kind of question of their teachers. I, I appreciate what I'm learning here. And I've been paying close attention and I'm trying to make the most of it. But I wonder, 
what are they saying from the other side? And I'd like to hear it from their own lips. And I'd like to be able to compare these things for myself. That's what a responsible Christian should be doing when you're being taught the Word of God by by others. And especially when you know that the movement that you're part of is controversial and books have been written taking a different point of view. That's when you have a special responsibility for your own sake, for your own soul's sake, to do the, uh, the, the, the study of your own. Yeah, thank you. Well, I very much appreciate you guys writing this book. It's very helpful. I also appreciate you taking the time in speaking to us over the last hour. Thank you very much. And we've got to be honest, we've hardly touched the sides of what you cover in this book. Anybody listening or watching, make sure that you you check this book out. I'm going to make sure there's a, a link in the description below wherever you're watching or listening. And thanks again, both of you. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so again. much, David. Good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, God thank bless you. you. Thank God you. Bless. God bless you. And to the bar listeners, thank you again for tuning in. And make sure that you hit that subscribe button so that you can get the show every single Tuesday. And just like today, we have some top, top guests coming up that you do not want to miss out on. And remember to check out the Bar Podcast website where you can listen to Dwayne's huge archive of interviews, which will keep you nice and busy. Until next time, to laugh for now.